Hi everybody, I'm Diane Brady. We are here at the Milken Institute Global Conference and I am seated with Richard Sandler, who is the director of the Institute and also the executive vice president of the Milken Family Foundation. First of all, welcome, thanks for having us. And you are the person every year who looks for the things that will blow our mind. I just sat through the session. Tell us about the three you picked this year. Hey, there were three actually extraordinary individuals as you just saw. They were all doing work. We try to get people that there's some synergies where we could tie it together. They're all doing work that's gonna affect healthcare, yeah. uh, disease cure in the future. And we get a bunch of names and we do some research on them. Fortunately today with technology being what it is and the internet being what it is, we can actually see interviews with them that others have done and see how they perform and what they do. And so that's the process we go by. So what, what blew your mind? Yeah, just, let's start with the person that um, immediately struck me was the one who's digitizing smell. So talk about how you discovered that and what's unique about him. Well, he's really the first one we've ever done that is focused on that area. Yeah. We've had people working on the brain, people working on augmented and virtual reality, which is, has to do with sight or sound. But he really got our attention because we haven't seen anyone that's done that. And what he's doing is so different because if you look at the other senses, they're spatial. Yeah. You know, you can see the space, you can hear, but the odor isn't, okay, yeah. the smell. And yet, on the other hand, we all go through airports and see the dogs going and sniffing, and then we read the articles about so-and-so or some animals seem to be able to sniff, yeah. sniff out a disease. And here's an individual that said, hey, I can create a, he called it a cyborg, a machine, a robot, that working with silicon chips and working with my knowledge of biology and molecules, I could replicate that and make it even better and allow everybody to get the benefit of that. Because don't forget, every single person on that panel today talked about democratization of healthcare. Well, I, let's start with the, this This guy is from Nigeria, which I thought was interesting, but to what end? So really, the goal of to digitize smell, I think about those cancer sniffing dogs and yeah. things like that. So it really is about improving human health, yes. detecting drugs, or could it be all that and more? Correct, it is all that and more, but his goal is basically to create a machine, which you think he's doing, that's affordable. Yeah. That every one of us, when we get up in the morning, we go into our bathroom, and there it could test our breath, it could take the odors of, from what we're doing, and it could give us a real-time picture of what our health is that day. Yeah. Um, just, you know, everything's going on. It's like, it's not, you're not just weighing yourself, right? A lot of people have a scale. And now it can give you a picture, but what it really can also do is, if you, God forbid, have some disease, whether it's a cancer, Parkinson's, whatever, it will detect that long before you, you would ever know. You can smell Parkinson's? Apparently, yes. I didn't know that. That's interesting. In fact, if you looked at one of the slides that he put up, it was a woman who detected her husband's Parkinson's disease in England long before he was, could, could be diagnosed. It's incredible how we're using animals too right now to really sort of rep, like take replicate their skill set in a digital realm and then apply it to healthcare. Talk about the digital operating room and such, because um, that one's interesting too. How did you come across that? Um, you know, to, somebody brought her, to, brought, us, uh, brought her to our attention and what she was doing was just sort of fascinating. First, what she first started to do was to create a situation where you could have a surgeon who is an expert in a typical surgery basically scrub in, mm -hmm. at least virtually scrub in from a thousand miles away to a surgeon who had never done that surgery for an operating room and with a tablet and a webcam could instruct them what to do. And they could actually see, he could actually touch on his picture, look and see that, you know, cut a centimeter here or whatever else. So she was trying to make surgery surgeons available where they are not. Um, so we, we should tell people the companies and the people. Can we do that? Yes, yes, so what, yes. What yes. is her name? Uh, her name was Nadine Hashasharam. Yep. She's a doctor. She's a surgeon. Uh, her company is Proximy. Yep. Um, that she has started, which is to digitize the operating room. So not only to allow a surgeon to virtually transform, but to uh, basically digitize the operating room. Be able to videotape surgeries not just the surgery itself, but look at all the different um, all the different elements that a doctor is looking at in a surgical room. 
what's the blood pressure, what's the breathing rate, what's yeah. the temperature and all that and digitize it so that it's available to doctors around the world using machine learning and artificial intelligence mm -hmm. to allow a doctor to access exactly what they're looking for. Because mm -hmm. as she said, when she grew up, surgery was see one, teach one, do one. Yeah. And you'll notice the what is similar about all three of those, one. Yeah. Okay, and this is basically saying, hey, why doesn't a surgeon that's never seen this before have the opportunity to get the benefit of what is being done. So topic number three. Topic number three is the, uh, that's generate, the bioscience. Yep. I say in many ways, he's the most complex of what he's doing, because what they're trying to do, they're using machine learning to discover more protein types and protein combinations and apply those protein combinations to diseases, to cells, yep. to see what works. And they could do this in real time, literally, hundreds of thousands of times faster than it's been done before in an analog world. And therefore, they're bringing more cures for diseases, more vaccines, more medicines, faster to more people, and also making it more affordable. So let me ask, in terms of the, are all three of these, um, are they candidates for support from the Family Foundation, or is there I'm curious about the pipeline of, of how you source these. I know, of course, being Milken, you have a lot of people that come to you and just say, look at me, look at me. But is, is there a foundation component to this in terms of support? There's a foundation component only from the point of view that we're trying to make the world better yeah. and make people's conditions better. Yeah. But basically, we're a nonprofit, okay? Yeah. And they're trying to raise money. But there are plenty of people that are here that are trying to both make the world better and find good investments. So by their coming here, they're able to connect with venture capital funds, with funds, but we don't really have an investment in any of those people. Now, we have another arm of the family office that does investing separate and apart from the yeah. nonprofit, um, but there's really no tie-in between really any what, of them. What kind of blows your mind, and then the committee, talk about, you've now done this for 10 years, correct? Yes. You've been doing this particular session. Yeah. Are there any that stand out even historically, and you've seen them sort of move on and further develop their technology. I'm curious about the trajectory of... Yeah, we did. We had um, a woman that was uh, involved at Google for many years in creating affordable screens and computers, and she felt that same technology could be used to create basically a wearable MRI. Oh, okay. That you don't have to get into a huge machine that costs millions of dollars, yeah. that you could basically see inside the person she's been developing that and she came back a few years later she's making strides in that what really interests me and what she's doing is creating a brain machine interface um, and so you know there's a lot of work being done out there you now everybody talks about chat gpt being a sort of a tipping point you know certainly for the consumer are you seeing tipping points in technology especially with regard to health care. But again, you know, you're on the front lines with Milken seeing, you know, some of this frontier technology. What are you seeing this year? Is it, uh, are we moving into a new area or is it really just a continuation of the type of technology we've seen in the last 10 years you've been doing this? Well, I would say in the last four or five years, you know, we have taken huge leaps in what we can do in using AI machine technology that can do things much faster in a much different way for the positive. There's yeah. been a lot of sessions here about yeah. the dangers of AI, but in the positive, so if you take, just, just take COVID, what we've all experienced here in the last couple of years, you know, Mike Milken was very, very involved in interacting with um, the National Institute yeah. of Health and others during that period of what can we do? What can faster cures at the Milken Institute do to help? And what we saw was that here you had a disease that was able to be sequenced by doctors, and within 63 days, yep. there was a vaccine in a human arm. Okay, it used to take five to 10 years. So there's a perfect example. Now, what the gentleman on my, Mike Daly on, mm -hmm. um, on Generate Bioscience was telling me that what they're trying to do is create a situation where they will be able to take a vaccine like that, maybe even do it quicker, and have it so effective that it will kill the disease no matter what the mutation is. Mm. Okay, um, so science is going much, much faster. What would you say in terms of the zeitgeist here, 
places like um, you know the Global Institute, Davos, it's, we're always looking for the mood. You know, what's the mood of the business community, the health community? Have you detected anything here in terms of optimism, pessimism? There's certainly been a lot of news this week alone in terms of what's happening in Washington. Right. Look, you, it depends what session you go to, but if you walk through the halls, which is probably the most interesting yeah. thing here, and you've been talking to a lot of people too, there's a buzz here about what people are able to learn, what they're getting out of it, the quality of every session. I mean, right now, as we're talking here, there's probably seven sessions going on. Yeah. And people are telling me they can walk into any session and learn something. Um, because Isn't that always are, the case, though? It's always the case, except it's not always the case that you have people sitting on the panels that are really at the cutting edge and can articulate what they're doing, you know, in a way. But, look, that's, a, that's the thing that's amazed me as I've watched this event over the last 31 years evolve it's the people that come here and the people that want to be here okay mm -hmm. so i've never been to davos what i've been told is that this is a place where everybody is far more accessible yep. than they are in davos you know we've had three governors here this week you can go up and talk to them you don't have to you know have a special pass or anything yep. to do that there um, seems to be more optimism in terms of, despite what's happening in the economy, I would say people are more optimistic we've been interviewing than most. I don't right. know if you've found that yourself. I have found that too. And I think because they, I think people have become, a lot of people here have learned from the past. So when they see a situation that we're in right now, whether we're going to have a soft landing or hard landing, is it going to be an actual recession or just a downturn, they're prepared because they've seen it before, or at least they studied it before. It used to be every generation would sort of start from scratch. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think people are optimistic that there's so many opportunities out there. And, but yeah, look at this is a tough time. We've seen a number, we've seen three bank failures, you know, in the last five weeks. I know. What well, good timing with the news. Let me go back to you and put the spotlight on what blows your mind. At this juncture, is there anything you would say that in general is blowing your mind about the environment. You've seen a lot of different candidates to get the three on stage. Where are we right now in terms of, are we on the cusp of a new wave of what you're seeing in technology? Are you, is your mind more blown this year than it was last year? Or I don't know if it isn't because I've had the privilege of basically doing this every year yeah. and seeing what people are doing. But really what blows my mind is sort of what I said at the end of the conference. It's the humanity of the people that are there, okay? They're not cyborgs, okay? They're not machines. They're doing this because they care. I mean, they mo every one of them came there for some emotional attachment of somewhere. You know, the, the, you know, Dr. Uh, Hashash Haram, yeah. she, her grandmother taught her about philanthropy. She saw the devastation of what it did in her home country in Lebanon when she was there during the Civil War. She saw a doctor making a difference in people's lives. She wanted to make a difference in people's lives. That's what brought her to this. Yeah, and it's so. not, the tech titans of Silicon Valley. It's people from around the world, Africa, Europe, et cetera. So, right. Richard, thanks for joining us. Look forward to seeing what blows your mind next year. Thank you, Diane.